this morning we are going to we're going to continue our journey to Revelation this morning. Um, believe it or not, it's been six weeks. This is the sixth week that we've we've been kind of going through this journey, this study. I did, really didn't know why God was taking us this through all this, but I, I kind of, it's starting to crystallize now. Sometimes you just have to be faithful and follow where he leads. Amen. Yeah. Amen. 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 So we, we're going to be in Revelation 12 this morning, and we're going to be in the first, um, first six verses, Revelation 12. Our sixth week through this journey, which is a survey, we're surveying John's revelation that was given to him by Jesus that if you remember John was personally taken by Jesus into heaven he said come up here and he was instantly at the doorway of heaven and he, and he went in that door and we've been talking about all the marvelous things that he saw when he was in heaven the throne and of course the God on the throne and the elders and all the beauty that's going on in heaven and the worship that's going on and we talked about the transactions that are happening in heaven we said heaven's just not this place where you go get on your silky hammock and swing for the rest of eternity there is actually stuff happening in heaven and at at, at this particular point um, where we pick up the scripture and where we talked about last week is this is during the time of the, of the tribulation, okay? So the church is in heaven, but the tribulation period is still happening on earth. So that's kind of where we are from that perspective. And, and we said that even then, transactions are being made to win over the earth, for the, to prepare for the final battle, if you would say, okay? So I trust you all have been reading along in Revelations with me through this, right? Yes. You go home and read this stuff, right? Yes, sir. Okay, good, because I could be making up anything. <laughs> I always tell you guys, go home and read for yourselves. Um, so, so there are reasons why I think we're in Revelations right now. One of it is because I think, number one, it offers insights on what is to come. Right. And it, God has prepared this beautiful book to show us what's coming so that we don't have to sit around all day and wonder what's next. Right. We have privilege as followers of Christ, as his children, to have a glimpse into the things that are coming. It also gives us perspective on the things that we hear out in the world. For whatever reason, churches have been afraid of preaching and revelation. It's a book in the Bible. That's how I know it's important and that we need to talk about it. Um, and, and guess what? There are people out there who aren't even church folk who have their own spin on what revelations is and what it means. And most of them don't belong to a church, haven't studied a word or whatever else, but they will tell you what these uh, words mean. So it's good that you know what your church believes. And it's good that you know what your pastor believes. So in, unless I preach on it or teach on it or we talk about it, you're just at the will of all those people out there who make up their own version of what it means. Amen? Amen. So, but mostly the biggest thing I want you to get out of this study is that this is a tremendous encouragement. This book should be encouraging. It should, it should encourage your soul to know what Louise and John said this morning, that no matter what it is you're going through, we already know what happens at the end of the book. We already know what happens at the end of the story. We already know that we are walking in victory right now. The victory is ours because the victory is the Lord's, amen? And we are of the Lord. So we should just always walk in here joyful, filled up with the Spirit, no matter what's going on in our lives, no matter what we're facing, whether it be a physical ailment or a financial ailment or something going on in your household, there is still this knowledge, this, this foreseeing that we have a victory in Jesus Christ, amen? And it's not a temporary victory, it's an eternal eternal victory. Amen. Hallelujah. So today we're moving on to the second half of the book of Revelation. Um, remember the, the first half we, we talked about, we started in the first half, and if we were to have read through chapter nine, which we didn't get all that, but we got some of it, it deals with the timeline um, and the plan of the tribulation, right? And then here in, in chapter 12, things kind of switch. Chapter 12 through 19, it still deals with the timeline, but now the focus is on the characters and the people of the tribulation, okay? One writer, I thought, put it best. He said, in Revelation 4 through 9, we see the events of the tribulation through a telescope. 
So we're standing off far looking at it. But once you get to chapter 9, all of a sudden you're looking at it through a microscope. Okay, so we're, we're taking a deep dive. We're moving from the mezzanine down to the floor right now on everything that's going. Is that, all, is that okay with you guys? Can we take a closer look? So, so here we are. Since, since the fall of Satan, there's been a constant war going on between darkness and light. Ever since he's fallen, there has been this, there has never been a time in history where there wasn't this war that's going on in the background. Amen? He, you, we know that he was kicked out of heaven. We know that, that he was kicked out of heaven. Not only was he kicked out of heaven, but he was kicked out of heaven and he took one third of the angels with him. Okay? He was then consigned to earth, and then when he got to earth, he set about the business of ruining the paradise that God set up for us here on earth. And he dragged Adam and Eve, and he dragged all of humanity, you and me, right into the crosshairs of this war. We're right in the middle of it. We're in the crossfire, the crosshair. This war is going on all around us, and the funny thing is, most of us don't even know it. Most of us don't even realize that there is a war waging, waxing uh, hot all around us. But chapter 12 breaks this down and it gives us a panorama of the warfare. Not just the warfare that will take place at the end of times, but it gives us a glimpse of the warfare that's taking place each and every day in your lives. And that's what I'm talking about today. You see, in order for us to overcome the attacks and the warfare of the devil, we need to know his strategy. We need to understand what he's up to. We need to understand what his moves are and the way he likes to do things. I was reminded, and John will appreciate this because he's a historian, of, of a world, the World War II general, um, George C. Patton. Right. Great, great general of World War II. Some of you are young enough to have remembered him. Um, his his adversary in Germany in World War II was none other than Erwin Rommel. OK. And they faced each other many times in battles in the northern part of Africa. And, and he was his adversary. They were each other's matches. They were both equally uh, fantastic at their jobs. They were renowned at their jobs. But, but what Rommel didn't know is that Patton read his book. Well, what are you talking about? Rommel wrote this book on war and strategy. He wrote this book on how to engage in war and the things you should do in war and how to be successful in war. But Patton read the book. He studied the book. He, he, he put the book in his memory, and he made his war plan against Rommel based off of the information that Rommel wrote in his book. And, and it's said that the, the, the story is that one day they faced each other in one of these battles and they got so close to each other as Patton was whipping Rommel's behind and, and Patton popped out of the tank and looked Rommel dead in the eye as he was passing him and said, I read your book, Rommel. I read your book. At which time he went ahead and crushed that army. Now, I give you that example to say that for us, it's God's book that we need to read that gives us the strategy on what Satan is doing. Amen. Yeah. See, there are no secrets to what he's doing. There's no, no secret plan or something that we don't know about. It's in God's book. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians, or yeah, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, you know the, the scripture, for we are not ignorant of his devices. We should not be ignorant of the devil's devices. But the problem with believers today and the problem with the church today, if I may say, is that far too many Christians ignore the devil's devices. They ignore the strategy of the devil's devices, and they're ignorant to the things that the devil is doing in their life. Now, this is sad because it causes them to live in constant fear. It causes the church to, to live uh, 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 depressed and defeated. It causes Christians to live in a state of not knowing what's coming next. Basically sidelining us in this battle that's going on. 
But if they'd only read the book, they'd recognize what I kept saying over and over earlier today. They'd recognize, number one, the wiles of the devil. But number two, they would recognize that we win, we win, we win. And every time the devil waxes hot in your life or things get stirred up in your life, I would just challenge you to look him dead in the eyes and say, I read the book, Satan. I already read the book. You are defeated. We can't lose sight of the fact that the church is in the midst of this ongoing battle, but it will end in Satan's defeat. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So today, for a short time, maybe, I'll be talking to you from the subject, the invisible war. The invisible war. How about that, Sean? We we had a talk beforehand. That's why I laughed when you said that. The invisible war. That's why I laughed when Linda uh, um, said some things before worship. I was like, she's already in my scripture. Which that happens. It just happens. That's the Holy Spirit. Um, In the first six verses of Revelation 12, there are four notable characteristics of this invisible war that we're going to talk about. Four notable. What I'm doing is I'm opening the book on Satan's strategy and what's going on. I want you guys to have an idea of why we're in this war, what we're doing here, what's at stake, and what does it mean for you. The first thing you need to know The first characteristic of this invisible war is it involves a people. That A is important. Not people. Yes, it's people, but it's a specific people. This war involves a specific people, specifically a nation of people, a group of people. So I'm going to ask you to follow along. I didn't put all the scripture up here, but if you are in in chapter 12 of Revelation, starting in verse 1, it reads, Now a great sign appeared in heaven, and it was a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of 12 stars. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. First thing should be on your mind is who is this woman? Who is this woman? There have been a lot of guesses to who this woman is. And trust me, I've done a lot of reading to make sure that that what I'm sharing with you is is accurate, (laughs) at least from a consensus standpoint and a praying standpoint. Uh, uh, but, But who is this woman? The Catholic Church says this woman must have been Mary. I would say not. And and some churches say this must be the church. And and As we read on, you'll see why it's not the church. Um, But when you study the Bible, you can always find answers to mysteries in the Bible by cross-referencing imagery or scripture. Because chances are, if God gives us something, and this is interesting because John just taught this morning on how to study the Bible. So John, this is like the, the, the addition to your teaching. Your class is still going on. But, but, but what happens when God gives you some imagery or something that doesn't quite make sense, typically you can cross-reference it and it will show up somewhere else in the Bible to give you context, okay? And, and that's kind of what, what Bible scholars have done with this imagery here. You see, there, there's another place in the Bible that has the same motive and the same imagery, and it's in Genesis 37, where if you remember, young Joseph had a dream. He was having an unpopular dream. Every time he would dream something, it was about someone bowing down to him, which ultimately got him, you know, kicked out and sold off into slavery, but that's another story. Um, he tells his father that he dreamed of the sun, the moon, and 11 stars. Interesting. And when we make the comparison, don't get tied up over the fact that this is 11 stars and Revelation talks about 12 stars because he is one of the 11 stars, which would make it 12. And I'll get to that in a second. But the woman is clothed with the sun. This speaks of the heavenly glory, right? And the moon is under her feet, which speaks of dominion and power. And here's where the correlation can be made is that she wears a crown, and this this speaks of her status and her royalty, but the 12 stars, just as in this dream that young Joseph has, speaks of the 12 tribes of Israel. 
speaks of the 12 tribes of Israel. So he dreamed of 11 stars, meaning that his, his siblings, his brothers, okay, and him being the 12th star. And we can also look in Genesis 15 and 15 where God makes an also important promise to Abraham, an important promise that is one of the main reasons why the war waxes so hot. He makes the promise. He says, Abraham, look now towards heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, so shall be your descendants, your descendants. Once again, we know as people who read the Bible that God is speaking to Abraham about his future generations. And we know that it's from Abraham's line that we get the 12 tribes of Israel. So we have enough information to, to kind of uh, agree and land on the fact that this woman is the nation of Israel. Yet throughout history, Israel has been harassed. Israel has been oppressed. Israel has been opposed. Israel has been attacked and persecuted. But it still survives. It still survives. In the Old Testament, we read that Israel was taken over and taken captive by Babylon, and the Babylonians actually destroyed Israel and took the inhabitants back to Babylon where they served for 70 years before letting them go again. In the New Testament, we, we know that the Roman Empire came in in 70 AD and burned Jerusalem down, burned Israel down, and, and massacred 1.6 million Jews is what it's estimated. And then later, if that wasn't enough, in 135 AD under the Roman emperor Hadrian, that same thing happened again. And if that wasn't enough, it was followed by thousands of years of diaspora, them being separated and dispersed and oppressed and persecuted. Even in the Spanish Inquisition, which we read about, they, they told the Jews, you either convert now to Christianity or we're killing you. And they killed millions of Jews. And then World War II, which is in our brief history, there were six million Jews who were exterminated. Over and over again, and I didn't mention all of it, but over and over and over again, all throughout history, this nation is persecuted. Yet the nation still exists today. And it's interesting because I look back to Isaiah's prophecy in Isaiah 66, and he says, shall a nation be born in a single day? And we know that it was on May 14th, 1948, in a single day. So, so what does all this mean, Pastor? What is all this about Israel? So how is it that this group of people have been hassled and oppressed and gone through all that, yet they're still here? Why are they so important, Pastor? They haven't they haven't uh, called Jesus their Messiah yet. We, we've claimed Jesus. Shouldn't we be the important ones? Why are they important? Well, you remember that God made a promise to who? Abraham, right? It's because of this invisible war that's going on that, that these people are at the center of this oppression, right? They are protected and they are kept by God's grace and his mercy. Why? Because God made a promise to them. God made a promise to them. But that's also why they're in the middle of this invisible war. This is why they're taking the brunt of this war. What about verse 2? And I'll explain more in a moment. Just, just hang, ride with me. We're getting there. Then being with child, verse 2, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. Is there any question who the child is? The, the child who is given birth to by this woman who we are saying is the, the Jewish nation, is who the Jews have longed for for generation upon generation. It is the Messiah. It is Jesus. The child is our Lord. The child is our Savior. So this woman, this nation of Israel gave birth. We know that Jesus is of the line of Abraham. Amen? He is of the tribe of Judah. Amen? So this woman has given birth to, to Jesus. She bore, if you have any, if you need clarification, in verse 5, it says she bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. 
and her child was caught up to God and his throne. John, excuse me, John describes the male child in undeniable terms. He rules with a rod of iron. It speaks to his sovereignty, right? It speaks to his absolute power. There simply is none greater than Jesus. He was caught up to God and his throne. This speaks to the ascension. We know that one, he, he died once, never to die again, and rose, and he ascended to heaven and now sits on the right side of God, on the, on the throne of God. His ascension, he reigns in heaven. Amen? Amen? So this conflict involves a people, which we can agree is the Jewish nation. And then here's my second point. The second notable characteristic of this invisible war is it includes a perpetrator. It includes a perpetrator. Let's read verse 3 and 4. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems, which are crowns, on his head. The tail drew a third of the stars of heaven, which are the angels that he pulled from heaven, and threw them to earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. This is the, this is the invisible war right here, folks. This, this capsulizes it right now, right? Now, now, here we don't have to guess who the dragon is, right? But in case you did need to guess who the dragon was, let's go to verse 9. And it says, so the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceived the whole world. Did you guys know that the devil is still deceiving the whole world today? Yes. He, cast, he cast him to earth and his angels were cast out with him. Now, Here's what's important to understand, and this is probably why a lot of pastors don't preach on Revelation, um, because there is, there is symbolism in Revelation. We believe the Bible is literal, but we also believe that there are symbolic references that add to its, its realness, its reality, if it makes any sense. So, so this description of the devil is, I would, I would say, a symbolic reference to the reality of his character. And I'll explain my point in a moment. You can disagree with me. It's not a heaven or hell issue. Um, I don't believe it's necessarily a physical description of the devil, but I believe it's a moral description that speaks of his awful character, his horrible, vile, contentious, deceitful, and ruthless character. That, that, it, it's like when you watch the cowboy movies, the spaghetti uh, westerns back in the day. Do we honestly believe that when there was a fight between the good guys and the bad guys, that the good guys went and put on their white suits and their white hats and the bad guys went home to put on their black hats? <laughs> no, but this is the way it was depicted so you'd have a, a, a picture of who was against who and why they were against who. And I believe that John is doing the same thing as he's seeing all this unfold before him. He's saying, look, there is this beast who is horrible. And he describes him in the most horrible ways. Uh, so, pastor, why do you say that? In, in Ezekiel 28 and 12, God describes Satan uh, and, and he says, you were the seal of perfection. You were full of wisdom and you were perfect in beauty. Satan was a beautiful angel. And I don't believe when he got cast out that it came with a red suit and a pitchfork. This idea, thank you, John, this idea <laughs> of the devil wearing a red suit with horns and a pitchfork has prevailed, prevailed throughout generations. And I believe it all goes back to this one passage. Why am I taking time to talk about this? I'm talking about it because people in assuming this ridiculous picture of the devil have begun to discount the fact that this beast is real. So they make fun of it. They dress up on Halloween as him. 
They make comic strips about it. There are ads about it. People put them on their hot sauce bottle. It's cute. It's There's a devil in this ear and an angel on that ear. And, and what's happened is that through this imagery that people have begun to embrace the devil because he's harmless, right? Hey, look at the Duke blue devil. You can go cheer with Duke basketball, right? It's good. The devil loves Duke basketball. Right. He's our he's our pal. But here's the one thing all throughout history. The devil's narrative has been to duplicate, replicate, pretend to be godlike. So all the attributes that we have for our God, our friend and 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 graceful and merciful and loving and understanding. He tries to put on the same act. Amen. So this this is what here. There's an interesting statistic. The Gallup poll, uh, the Gallup organization did a poll and it says that most Americans still believe in God by a slight margin. But most Americans still believe in God. But on the contrary, most Americans do not believe in the devil. It's 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 just ridiculous. This guy, this this dragon with horn. I mean, we got. Game of Thrones and all these shows that have these type, and I'm not saying anything about it, but I'm saying when you are, when this is shown to you as entertainment, okay, and you see these images, you become socialized to them. And you don't have the fear or the respect for him as you should. So it's okay to to do this or to do that or the people who, who worship the devil, oh, they're cool. I mean, they're just, you know, they do their thing, I do my thing. And the people who, who, who run in those circles who do that, the reason why they worship a devil is because the devil just seems like he's friendlier than what Jesus has all these rules that you got to follow and all these things you got to do and you got to go to church and you got to give money to church and you got to do all these things. But if I just hang out with the devil, he's probably not even real anyway then I got some, something cool I can put on my shelf and say I'm down with this tribe. So we have to be careful that, that we understand that, that, that this is a symbol of how vile and cruel and ferocious the devil is. And he's not to be played with. He is fierce and he's playing for keeps. He's playing for keeps. He's, he's playing to kill you. That's what the devil is about. C.S. Lewis said that humanity falls into two equal and opposite errors concerning the devil. Either they take him altogether too seriously or they don't take him seriously enough. Right? On one hand, you have people who deny that there is a devil. And then on the other hand, you have people who are obsessed with the devil. And, 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 for the people who are in denial, let me just tell you, you can't have a more powerful enemy than the one that you, you don't even think exists. That's the most powerful enemy that you can have. If you have an enemy that you don't believe exists, he can outflank you, he can outplan you, he can outmaneuver you. Why? Because you don't even think he's there. Now to the other people, equally debilitating is the other extreme. These, there are far too many Christians who think the devil is in everything. The devil is real. The devil does stuff. The devil is the devil, right? We can agree on that. But he, the devil isn't in everything that goes wrong in your life is not the devil. So, there, there is a rule of consequences too. Sometimes you do thing and there's an offsetting consequence to the thing that you did, Right? So the devil, he's not in every. The devil's not behind everything. The devil's not in the doorknob. You can't be like, I'm not going into this room of opportunity because if I touch it, the devil is there, right? There are people who want to cast the devil out of their scrambled eggs in the morning or, <laughs> or the person that prepared it, right? They fail to realize that, that greater is he, you got that, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Amen. Amen. He's the devil is vile. He's ferocious. He's all that. But you have someone living in you that's more powerful than the devil. Right. Right. And we'll get to it next week. I, but I just want you to know right now that this battle right now, God has not lifted a finger against the devil yet. 
There are battles. There are wars going on be, between um, the angels and the demons and this, that, and the other, so on and so forth. Don't think that God is sitting there wrestling with the devil right now, trying to see who can get the upper hand. He hasn't even, he hasn't even moved yet on Satan. And when he does, it will be over with. Just that quick. Amen? And I, I think far too many Christians be like, oh, this is this, this battle between God and Satan. Satan is not God's equal at all, right? At, not even close, right? And we know through Job and other books, I'm getting way off track, that, that, that sometimes I think God pities Satan and even entertains him from time to time. Because we read through the Bible that sometimes the devil shows up on God's doorstep with some silly request or conversation. And God just like, yeah, whatever, dude. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you want to go mess with Job. Okay, he's cool. Yeah. But, but God has not lifted a finger against the devil yet. So don't think that for whatever reason that our salvation, our, our eternity is in any way in jeopardy because of this invisible war that's going on. It's not at all. Okay. John White wrote in his book, the, the Flight, or The Fight, rather, he said, have no delusions about demons or their hostility, because if you're in Christ, basically, they're, you're going to have to just deal with them. Yeah. Have no delusions. They, you're dealing with them. If you are in Christ, you're going to deal with dark. You're going to deal with stuff, right, from the devil. Now, you only need to worry if, if you're lukewarm, if you're not following Christ, right, and you're not getting any tax. If nothing's jumping off in your life right now, if everything is peachy king every day, always, it's good, you might want to check your faith, Amen. right? Or check your practice of your faith, right? But typically, if all hell is breaking loose in your life, it's because the devil is literally tossing all hell at you to get you away from Christ because he knows you're dangerous. He knows you're dangerous. And he doesn't want you to become who Jesus has promised that you will be. But you better stand up and walk in your promise no matter what's breaking loose around you. Right? Amen. Because, because God's got you. And he's not, a prom he's not a promise breaker. So let's go through this symbolic description of the devil real quick. And I'll, I'll fly through it. First of all, in verse 3 and 4, it says that the devil has seven heads. What is that about? Seven is the number of what? Ah. Right. Not perfection, but completion. Right. In, in some instances in the Bible, it has been perfection, but it's more completion and totality. This speaks to the devil's comprehensive knowledge, intelligence and wisdom. He's a smart dude. The devil is his IQ is off the charts. Right. Think about it. He crafted a mutiny in heaven. And in doing so, got a third of the angels to go with him. Yeah, he got kicked out, but he, he's a smart guy. The devil is no joke. He, he studied human nature for thousands and thousands of years. This is what I need you to understand. He knows everything about, every, he can't make you do anything, but he knows every tendency that you do. He knows why you do it. He knows the things you, he knows when you say one thing, you're thinking another thing. He can't read your mind. That's God. God is omniscient. He's all knowing. The devil is not, but the devil watches every little thing that you do. And then he will roll out a temptation to bring you down behind that action. That's why I always tell people, you better watch what you say. You better watch what you put out into the atmosphere, right? The things that you speak, your words are the devil's tools to twist and turn and to set things around you. When you talk about somebody, when you show your dissatisfaction to someone, when you gossip, then the devil goes quick to work. Oh, he, does, he doesn't like her. She doesn't like her, this, that, and the other. Ooh, I'm going to fire. I'm going to throw another log on this fire. I'm going to make it even worse than it is. You better speak blessings and goodwill over everyone. Everyone. Because sooner or later, the devil is going to say, I can't seem to get my arms around this guy. I can't seem to pick out anything that I can, I can really give him a hard time on. And the devil will move on. But watch your actions. Watch what you do. Watch where you go. Watch what you look at. Watch what you listen to. Because the devil's feeding off of all of it. He's feeding off of all of it. He has 10 horns. The horns are symbolic of his strength. And his weaponry, 
right? Because in nature, an animal's horns, the length or the, the, the strength of their horns dictate how powerful they are in their ecosystem. So the devil has 10 horns. Satan has dominated this world, right? Even Jesus said that he is the God of this world, little g, right? The God of this world. And the number of horns we can speculate represent a coalition, and we'll talk about it later, or you'll read about it. I might not talk about it later in Revelations. It's a coalition of 10 world armies, enemies, or kingdoms that he will come into a, a partnership with the Antichrist and forming his own kingdom on earth, trying to form his own kingdom on earth at the end times. So that's what that's a reference to. Let's talk about the crowns, the diadems. He has been crowned by the earth as its king. We crown, when Adam and Eve disobeyed God, they crowned him as their king. They crowned Satan as their king. And this world was given over to sin. And kings and kingdoms ever since then have been crowning Satan king ever since then. His appearance, like I said, it's not that of a big red fiery dragon. As a matter of fact, he wants you to think that he's benign. He wants you to think that he's misunderstood. He wants you to think that he doesn't even exist. And if you do believe he exists, he's not that bad, right? And the people who deal with him aren't that bad either. And they're not that demanding. That's what he wants you to do. He wants you to crown him as king over your life. So here we are. We have this war. Um, the characteristics are there is a people who we believe is Israel. There is a perpetrator who we know is Satan. But then there's a third thing. It entails a pursuit. It entails a pursuit. This war entails a pursuit. The devil is chasing something. This is the meat of the matter. This is why the war waxes hot. This invisible war between the woman, Israel, and the dragon, Satan, has everything to do with the third character, and that is this male child. Everything to do with this male child that's born. Let's look at verse 4 and 5 again. It says, his tail drew a third of the stars or a third of the angels of heaven and threw them to earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and his throne. Why does the dragon, why does Satan hate this woman so doggone much? It's because of the child that she births. He hates Israel because of the child that would come from Israel. It's, it's all about getting to this child and destroying the child because the child will one day rule over everything and snatch away Satan's authority. He sees this child as a direct threat to him. Remember the prophecy in Isaiah 9. It's, it's what we read at Christmas time. It says, for unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And what? The government will be on his shoulder. In other words, all authority is going to be on the child's shoulder. He doesn't have to check permission for anything. He doesn't have to, to, to caucus or to go out and, and campaign. And he doesn't have to do all these things. The government will be on him. When this child takes over again and establishes himself, there's going to be no question on who's in authority. And that scares the out of the devil. Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> Simply put, this child will be the king of kings who reigns forever and ever and ever. Amen. Satan, here's he, he. Satan, is, Satan knows the Bible, too, and he knows all that. Not only does he know about this prophecy that Abraham was promised way back when, right? But he also remembers something even further back, that there was a curse spoken over him in the Garden of Eden. See, this Bible thing, it all ties together. Satan was there when he said that the seed of the woman would crush his head. The seed of the woman would crush his kingdom. 
Ever since that promise was given, Satan's strategy has been to set out and to destroy the seed. The seed being that child who would destroy his kingdom. We see examples of of Satan, and you'll see a repeating theme here. Follow along with me. There are examples all throughout the Bible and history of Satan's attempts to thwart, to stamp out, to stomp out the seed. Here's a few. Satan conspired early on to, uh, to, to have Cain kill his brother Abel. Why? Because Abel was righteous. He hoped uh, to, to kill off the seed, but God. But God gave Eve another son, Seth, and it was from his righteous lineage that the seed went forward. Satan then, he, he caused evil to spread so badly across the earth that God had to wipe out the whole earth. And in wiping out the whole earth, he thought sure that that would wipe out this seed. But God kept eight people alive in an ark full of animals, and the line eventually led to Jesus from Noah's offspring. Esau tried to kill his brother. He, he said he was going to kill his brother's Jacob for, for everything that Jacob had done. Jacob was Isaac's son of promise. But God intervened and changed Esau's heart. And from Jacob came the 12 tribes of Israel. And oh, by the way, Jesus is from the line of Judah. Uh, The Egyptian Pharaoh, we can't forget about him. He ordered that all male Hebrew children, babies be killed. Clearly a satanic attempt to wipe out the entire nation of Israel and stamp out the seed. But God, (laughs) but God said, let my people go. And Israel was freed. Oh, we can go to Saul. We know Saul was a card. He was a crazy man. David did everything he could to win Saul's favor, but still Saul was demon possessed. Something happened. And like a madman, he did everything he could to kill David. But God protected David and Jesus would be born from David's royal line. Uh, Then we can just pop over to the book of Esther. There was a guy by the name of Haman who devised a plan to annihilate the Jews, but God. And as soon as Jesus was born, King Herod decreed that every child under the age of two in Bethlehem should be killed. But God gave Joseph a vision in the middle of the night and told him to flee. Yet another failed attempt at Satan to crush out the seed. Satan himself tempted Jesus in the wilderness. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. He suggested that Jesus, Jesus, just throw yourself over the edge and and your angels will swoop down and pick you up. Satan knew that if he threw himself down, there was a chance, a possibility that he would die at the bottom of the rocks. Uh, But God knew Satan's wiles and Satan's tricks, and instead of jumping, he rebuked Satan. But then one dark Friday afternoon, Satan must have thought that he had finally won. When they pulled my Lord's limpless body, limp body off of the cross, beaten, battered, broken, there must have been a party in hell going on. And as they drug his lifeless body to the tomb, Satan and all his angels, his demons, must have finally felt that they'd won. He must have finally thought that he had stamped out this seed and, oh, just in the nick of time. There must have been a celebration as Satan claimed victory. But Satan failed to read the fine print. John 10 and 18 says, Jesus speaking, no one takes it from me, talking about his life, but I lay it down myself. I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it again. This command I have received from my father. And three days later, he did just that. He got up out of the grave. Amen. You see, it's because of this victorious Easter morning um, that Satan now turns all of his wrath and all of his fury on the church. Because he thought he won. 
But now everything, he's turning it all loose on you. But wait, it's even worse. He turns, he turns even more on Israel. It's subjected to even more persecution and is in his, his target. Why? Why would he still concentrate on Israel after he failed to crush out this seed? Well, if you remember way back when, there was a promise, right, in the Old Testament that the Messiah would reign in Israel and in the city of Jerusalem. So now, instead of focusing on the child, because the child is already in heaven, there's nothing he can do about that. He's focused on stamping out the city of Israel. Because if he, or the, the state of Israel, if he could stamp out that, it would make God a liar because Jesus would never get to reign there. He's, he's crafty. He is crafty. That's why this invisible war is going on. That's why you are taking it on the chin every day and don't even know that you're taking it. That's why Israel is going through what Israel goes through. If Satan can destroy the nation, God can't keep all of his promises. So let's look at the fourth and final notable characteristic of this war. This conflict ends in premacy. It ends in premacy. What does that mean? Premacy simply means it ends in dominance and superiority. Dominance and superiority of our God. Whatever the battle, in every situation, Satan will lose and Jesus will win. This is always the end result. So I need to tell you this morning, make sure you're on the right side. Get off the fence if you're on the fence. If you're, if you're thinking twice about something or something has your mind tied up, get on the right side and quit fooling around. You already know what's going to happen. Verse 5, I, I read it. It said that he is going to rule, but with an iron rod. That means he's not going anywhere. He can't be voted out of office. He can't be taken over. He, he can't lose the throne. It means that he has absolute strength and authority. Be on the right side. But here's what I love about it is that he won't rule as some strong-armed tyrant. The Greek word for rule means to act as a shepherd, the one that's written here, believe it or not. The Greek word that's written here for rule means to act as a shepherd. It's similar to the word that's used for pastor or to shepherd. It's saying that, that he's going to rule, he's going to be in charge, but it's not going to be some, some mean uh, dictatorial rule. It's going to be a loving, overseeing, pastoring, I'm taking care of my sheep rule. That's what we have to look forward to. That's what heaven is going to be about. A God who's in charge, who always wants to make sure that you are okay. To make sure that you feel his love. That's the God that we serve. He's not going to stop loving you when we get there and just sit back and watch you praise all day. He's going to be returning that love back to you. He's going to be protecting, keeping, uh, 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 making sure that all of your needs are met every day for eternity. He is a firm leader. He's a gentle warrior. He is the tender enforcer. And just as Satan, the dragon, couldn't stop him from being born, as just as Satan, the dragon, couldn't stop him from enacting his redemption, and just as Satan, the dragon, couldn't stop him from ascending to the right hand of the Father, he won't be able to stop his eternal rule. He won't be able to stop it at all. So, so let me close with this. Don't let Satan stop Christ from ruling over your life. Don't let him do it. He, he, he's going to rule over the world, right? But individually, God gives you the power, right, to stand up to him. He gives you the power of choice. He gives you the power to say yes or no to Satan. He gives you the power to reject Satan or to receive him. Don't let Satan stop Jesus from ruling over you. It's up to you, church. 
It's up to you. It's up to you to read God's book and to know the devices of the devil. When you're frustrated and you just want to quit church or somebody looked at you the wrong way or did the wrong thing or you feel like you're not getting what you need from church, can you just step back and say, that must be Satan? Because I know that's not true. That's Satan again. Let, let, me, let, me, let me say one thing. You go to church to serve, not to receive. I'm just going to put it out there. We do everything we can to serve folks who come through the door, but you have a job to do when you walk into this local assembly, and that's to serve everyone around you. But most of all, to serve God in your worship, in your praise, in your giving, in your loving, in everything you do, you are a servant. And anything that pops into your mind that is outside of you serving somebody else is Satan. It's the devil. So when you feel like your personal needs outweigh the needs of the church, Satan. Okay, I'll move on. I didn't think I'd get many amens there. When your family is messy and it's out of control and people are bickering and you just want to punch out, get out of there, you just want to go to the bar and get a bottle of something and just drown yourself in that, Satan. It's Satan. He's, he stirred it up just right. He's, made, he's going like this at that point. I got him right where I want him. I can see by the things that are coming out of their mouths and the things that they are, they are looking at on TV, listening to, and the places they are going that this plan is working. So I'm just going to keep putting a dose of hell in their family. Satan, when you just want to do it your way, when you're tired of waiting on God, when you don't think he's listening anymore, or he's responding anymore, and, and you want to lean to your own understanding, that's Satan. That's Satan. That's Satan saying to you because he sees you getting fidgety, and he sees that you're reading your Bible less, and he sees you spending less time in prayer, and that's Satan saying, this thing's not really working. You got a better plan. What are you waiting on? Are you just going to sit around and wait for some invisible God to make some changes in your life? If he was going to do it, he would have already done it. Do it your way, Satan. And when you do it your way, instead of doing it God's way or waiting for God to do it, you just dig yourself a deeper hole. How many of you have had that experience? It's like, I, I, I should have known. You ever did some stuff and you go, I should have known better. That was stupid. What was I thinking? That's Satan. That's Satan. When your life is spinning so far out of control and you just can't seem to gain any balance and your tears from one night tie into your tears to the next morning and you just want to quit and you just want to die, and you just want to take your life, that's Satan. That's Satan. Don't let Satan rule in your life. Don't let him do it. Yeah, you are in the middle of an invisible war and you're being attacked left and right. Praise God. It means that you are valuable. It means that you are on this battlefield fighting for the end result, which will be eternity with a loving um, God who will be, he'll rule with an iron rod, but he'll also be your pastor and love you and take care of you and keep you. You need to wait for him. And at the end of the day, the invisible war is hot, but you need to be encouraged because we know who wins the invisible war. Amen? Amen. So I want to read this hymn, and I'll close because we still have to do communion. I want to read this hymn that's written by Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King, Martin Luther, who's the father of church reformation. He's the one that broke away from the Catholic church and said, there's more out here than this. And this is what he wrote. He says, and though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear for Christ has willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can adore, endure, for lo, his doom is sure. I love this last line. Yeah. One little word shall fail him, not fail, 
fell, F-E-L-L. In other words, one little word from God and he's done. He's done. Like, hey, give God praise right there. Amen. One little word shall fail him. So, so my question as we close right now is, is, are you under Christ's premacy? Are you under his rule? Are you under him? Is he your God? Or are you dancing somewhere in the middle? Or are you thinking about it, contemplating it? I just want to tell you right now that any second, we could hear that last trumpet. He could come bursting through the clouds. And if you have not made up your mind who you are following in that moment, then you're stuck. You're stuck. I don't know about you, but I want to be pulled up. I want to be taken up in glory. I want to join my brothers and sisters in Christ on that glorious day in the clouds. Amen.